Hey, oh, welcome everyone to episode 35 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to bring back Nikita Mikros. Uh, he's part of the Bumble Bear team, uh, created Killer Queen, worked on a whole bunch of other games. Um, I guess I could just let him tell you himself. Um, how are you doing today, Nikita? Good, good. How are you doing, Joe? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm glad you were able to come on. And right before we jump into everything, I just want to remind everyone... Um, to subscribe, like, follow, share the podcast or the video, wherever you're watching. Um, it means the world to us. We really appreciate your support. Um, and we'll keep these episodes coming for you every week. So Nikita, just refresh everybody on kind of where you stand in uh, video game development, what you've done, and what you've done since we last spoke. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so I've been making video games for a while. Um, I... Um, I really started my professional career like around 1997 doing shareware with my brother. Um, And then I did a lot of uh, flash games, um, a lot of games for like advertising. And then I did a lot of games for like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and those kind of things. Then um, I started making my own games again and i made killer queen with josh and then we built a company around that which was bumble bear and um lately i have been working on a new title called uh, abs versus the blood queen even though i don't know if it's going to be called that for much longer yeah um I want to talk to you. I want to. I want to focus on Abs versus the Blood Queen today, but I just want you to kind of refresh us on um, how Bumble Bear started and Killer Queen. Like, I just I'm trying to figure out the dynamic of like how you took the game and turned it into like a whole studio where you guys had employees and everything. Because I know a lot of the other teams that are in the indie scene right now are two, three, four people. Um, especially with where the situation of the world is right now, it's kind of hard to build out a team. So just Walk us down that path of kind of how you went from the arcade console to actually building a team around it and then moving into abs. I mean, it's actually almost like if I think about Bumble Bear, it's almost a reduction than an enlargement Um, in the sense that when me and Josh first started working together, we both had our own companies. So I had a company named Tiny Mantis and he had a company named Sorta Soft. And so at that time, Josh had two programmers that he was working with, uh, Kyle and Gyro. And I had, I had, I had like kind of a sizable staff. I had, um i had two artists working for me and i had uh two programmers Wen and tommy and then uh there was somebody yeah and then i don't know it, we were pretty we were a pretty big company um and what happened actually we had three artists working for me and then what happened was um, when we merged our companies, like, and we were mostly working on Killer Queen, like, me and Josh had actually done everything on Killer Queen. It was kind of a hobby project. So a lot of our former staff left and were not replaced. So we actually shrank from a much bigger team to a much smaller team. What grew was the logistics side, like, which we were totally not familiar with. We didn't know anything. Like, I mean, I never dealt with a salesperson or like, I never had to deal with like building things and then getting them to places, you know, like I just made games and then would sell them on the internet via whatever steam or, you know, the PlayStation store or whatever. But I never, I never had to deal with like, okay, now we're building a thousand pound project, a thousand pound product, and we have to ship it all over the country. 
like those those were like new kinds of problems and so it was clear that we needed more staff for that kind of thing also uh neither of us really had any sense of that we had to market our stuff i think that that has become more important over the years um especially since you know there's more competition um there's just more games out there it, it just seems like a more important role to to uh in a game company these days so we shrank development wise and we grew like logistics wise and marketing wise which is kind of interesting yeah, that is interesting that you guys already kind of had your own projects going. And when you came together to make Killer Queen, you're like, let's just kind of become one and focus on this. Um, yeah, that... like I, I was working on a project. I had been working on a project um, that I had done a, a Kickstarter for. And it was becoming more and more clear that like the money we had raised for from the Kickstarter was just not going to support this project. It was just too little money. And like... You know, so I basically had to kind of make a final build and just say, well, this is this is what it's going to be. And that's it, you know, because I Killer Queen was taking up more and more of my time. And I, I knew that, like, there was just no way that I could do both. And Josh had a he had a project that he had been working on for years and years and years and years. And he's still not really finished with it, which is Merriweather, which is a game about the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it's, it's, it's vast. It's like a, it's a really big game for such a small team that he, that he had. Um, so yeah, yeah. But we did, we did like, it became evident that really we had a new focus and we we really needed to kind of double down on that yeah and i mean killer queen has become huge at this point to the point where you ended up making a spin-off in a whole different kind of mode so that kind of leads right into abs vs the blood queen mm -hmm. um just jump into that for me let me know kind of how that idea came to be and why you guys decided to go that direction um well I, um, so at the end of February, I, um, I got on a plane with my mom. We went to California and the next day we got on a cruise ship and, uh, went on a cruise for eight days. So, you know, you're just kind of secluded from the world. Uh, we get back into port in Long Beach and, um, we had to stay an extra day because, I mean, like this was the first time that I realized what was happening with coronavirus. And, um, I mean, I'd heard about, you know, the, like that this flu was happening in Asia or whatever, but I figured it was going to be kind of like SARS where it wasn't really gonna affect me that much or whatever it's horrible but you know whatever um and so they we had to stay an extra day and then i was planning on going to gdc and um and i was gonna i was gonna play in that tournament and i wound up going to san francisco and you know that like the tournament was canceled. I was also supposed to go, we were supposed to have a booth for Bumble Bash at South by Southwest. And I was supposed to appear there and Snoop Dogg was going to be in our booth. Yeah. We were supposed to go down to that with you guys too. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, we went from like that to all of a sudden, like, so I got back, like long story short, got back to New York and the reality of COVID was really starting to hit. Like what, like once I got back to New York, especially, I was just like, okay, this is not going to be like a two week thing. This is, this may be three months, you know, like that's what I was kind of thinking at that time. Right. And then, uh, 
And then, you know, it dawned on me that, well, maybe it's going to be a lot more than three months. We don't know what the end of this is going to be. And Josh, and like, I, I was just like, I don't know if we can support our staff. I don't know if like, there was a lot of questions at that time. Like we just didn't really know financially how we were going to weather the storm. Yeah. The what if started to set in. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, PPP had not been announced yet. And like, we just didn't know. And, you know, it was like we had overextended the year before. So it wasn't like we had a great year the bef- the year before. So it was like we were already starting on shaky ground. And um, I, I, I didn't really know what we should do. And Josh really wanted to push that we do, um, you know, a home game, like a, a game uh, so that people can not forget about Killer Queen and like they could practice at home and, you know, whatever. And I, at first I was like, I don't know if this is the right move. Like, what's the audience for this going to be? Blah, 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 blah. And as we started tossing the ideas around, um, we, we kind of came, came to a consensus that, okay, this could be interesting as like a, as a KQ trainer, you know? And we, we quickly put together a prototype. It was kind of fun. Um, and then from that, Like, it just seemed like, as a trainer, it wasn't really hitting the mark, right? Like, it wasn't, it wasn't really going to be interesting for people that weren't Killer Queen players, that we really needed to expand the content. And, and so we started doing that, and we layered a theme on top of it, and we decided to do a Kickstarter, and and the Kickstarter went okay, and uh, you know we 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 hit our goal, and and then um, we just I remember leading up to the end of the Kickstarter, like I was working kind of really long hours. I was working like thirteen or fourteen hour days just to kind of keep up. And, uh, I remember like having this great sense of relief once, once the Kickstarter was done. Anyway, um, we've been working on, on it since then. We're, it's interesting, like working in a pandemic versus our normal way of working, which would be that normally we meet once a week at the studio and um, we kind of do our planning for the week and we do like a bunch of things uh, for Killer Queen. And, you know, it was clear that we couldn't really do that and having like a long all day thing on, on Skype would be kind of exhausting. So we fell in. So I, I suggested we start doing like a morning meeting every day. And that, and we've been doing that, and I have to say, like, that's really been a much more productive way of working, even more productive than the old way. I I feel like we've done so much more work than what we would normally do in a week. Yeah, I mean, Uh, you get everybody together and set expectations and goals for the day and talk about where you want to be at the end of the week and... And yeah. then you just keep following up every single day. We don't even do a weekly. We just do the daily. That's it. Right. You know, and sometimes the daily is a little bit longer. If we're pl- if like the, the daily meeting is like very short. Uh, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I plan on doing today. Here's my tickets, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and, and then sometimes like, it'll break, it'll break into, uh, some discussion about some game design feature or some art thing or music or audio or whatever. And we'll have like a longer conversation about it. 
but the actual crux of the meeting is pretty short and sweet. Um, that's been really helpful. And, um, you know, it's, I think post COVID we're probably still going to work this way because I think it's been working for us. Yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of people have, have found that out about it and it just, it seems to be more productive and there's just less wasted time with all the, the stuff that's going around in the office. Yeah. I, yeah, totally. I mean, but you need that wasted time, honestly, sometimes too. Right. Like I feel like sometimes it's okay. Like I'm kind of, I mean, it all depends on how, how the time is wasted. If it's, is it drive time? Is it commute time? Is it that, or, or could you add another hour and a half or two hours to the end of your day to relax? Yeah. But I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a, it, it's not about wasted time necessarily as much as, cause I, I am actually a big advocate for wasted time. Like I feel like it, the time that you think is wasted is when your brain is actually catching up. And that's when like creativity kind of seeps in, you know, that's it's definitely like a fair way to look at it. I guess I've never looked at it like that. Like I do things that are, it, I think it infuriates Josh, but I do a lot of things that, are purposefully inefficient. Like, like I, I just, you know, like I go to the bank to a teller. Like I go, I'm like, I, I do a lot of things that are just like, I know they take longer and that they are a waste of time. Cause I, I purposely want to build these weird breaks into my day. You know, like it's also interacting with someone that you yeah. will probably never see again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or that I'll see every day or every other right. day or whatever, you know, like mm-hmm. I know all the baristas at like the local coffee place near the office. I know them all, you know, I talk to them. I like, that's an interesting part of my day, you know, just like having conversations with them and just kind of clearing my mind and like hearing what they're up to and like what, what is interesting to them and, you know, whatever. Like, I, I think, I think you need that. I think you need a little, like it can't just be about work because then your work gets really boring. I think, I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, along that, that line of kind of changing it up and seeing other things. Um, can you tell us about Absurus the blood queen and what's different from killer queen to abs? Oh, I think it's just totally different. I, I think, uh, I mean, it's not totally different in the sense that, like, Abs is a character from Killer Queen. He moves exactly the same as he does in Killer Queen. Like, the physics are the same, all that stuff. But um, the fact that the game is single player and asymmetrical, it gives us a lot of freedom to do all kinds of things in level design that you just cannot do in Killer Queen. You can Like, the, the rigors of doing... Uh, a, a multiplayer level in Killer Queen are like people don't realize how um, how much thought we put into each one of those levels and like because it it's it's a really delicate balance and right I mean level design dictates pace of the game it dictates priorities it dictates how you win there's there's so much that goes into every level and it it has to be balanced yeah it has to be balanced it has to be especially balanced in killer queen right and especially like for high level play and for competitive play you know it there's there's just a lot of factors right like oh well you know if we put that platform there then there's no there's no way for the queen to escape you know, if there's like a pincer and blah, 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 blah. Like there's a lot, a lot of really, really intricate factors. So like a single tile can make a huge difference, you know? Um, Whereas with, with abs, because it's single player, like we can take a lot of liberties and be a lot more creative in the level design than we could, than we ever could in Killer Queen. And so that's, it's kind of refreshing to be able to just like be like, yeah, okay, that's not a standard jump, but who cares? You know, like it's fine. It's like a hard jump. Okay, no problem. You know, like 
where like there are things we would just never do in Killer Queen that we do in apps. And I think because it's so much harder, like anybody who's playing abs and like goes back to Killer Queen, I have to say I got to play a little bit of Killer Queen at Wonderville when we were shooting. We were shooting a um, a um, a video uh, like an advertisement for Black Emperor, um, and I got to play a little bit. And just because I've been playing abs so much, I felt like all of a sudden I was like a super grown. Like I just, like it was, it, it, it was really like, I can feel the difference a lot because it, in, in abs, you're required to do all kinds of weird, fancy things that you don't have to necessarily do. Like the challenges in killer queen are different for a drone, but still like, I, I really do feel like, even though we thought that maybe we weren't making a training game at some point, it is a training game for sure. Like right, the, I mean, you're getting used to the muscle memory and the, the jump distance and timings and all that stuff just becomes second nature that yeah. if you only played Queen, you wouldn't really ever oh, practice that stuff. Not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely not. I mean, if you're looking to get your Queen skills up in abs, that's just not going to happen. But uh, Maybe you need to make a Queen level. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we talked <laughs> about it. We talked about it, but it's just, it didn't really fit the game, you know? We did talk about it a lot. Like we talked about maybe that there would be a queen gate and um, just decided it wasn't that interesting in this game, you know, because there's not really a lot of vertical in the game. Like the game is, is twice, it's twice zoomed in from Killer Queen and it's mostly horizontal. So it didn't really, there was no situations where you really needed that dive. And that's really what the queen is about. It's all about the dive. Right. So it didn't make a ton of sense. So what is what is the objective of Abs vs. the Blood Queen, and where did you guys draw inspiration for the game from? I mean, uh, I know the art direction is pretty obvious where you got that from, but... Oh, really? How so? Yeah, it's, it's Killer Queen. Oh, yeah, sure. It's Killer Queen married with, like, a little bit of, like, you know, campy 60s horror movies, you know, um, like, and, and 50, like, you know, like, I, I mean, I, I drew a little bit of inspiration from that, but then, uh, as far as the, the, the goals of the game, I mean, you're just basically trying to get as far as you can. And then we decided that like, okay, let's just add some bosses and let's add an ending. And so it gave it a little bit more structure um as opposed to just being an endless runner but for most people it's pretty hard game so for them it's an endless runner like we're not even done like there's a whole third world that we're going to add to it and most people can't get to the end of the second world so um it is um for all intents and purposes it is a uh an endless runner in a lot of ways but i think as far as inspiration goes I think all of us on the dev team are big fans of roguelikes. And so we wanted to create a game that had dynamic content like a roguelike, um, where the levels were, were dynamically generated. Um, I mean, there's a great video that Gyro did about how the levels are constructed in the game and if you guys want to check it out i could send you the link um yeah do that yeah so the way that it works is we we create these small very small levels that are all interlocking so um at the beginning uh of every you know depending on the, the seed um which is like a it's kind of if you know anything about random number generation, there's uh, there's a starting point, right? A random number generator doesn't actually create random numbers. What it does is it creates a sequence of numbers based on that initial number, and um, and so whatever that seed is, then it will generate a, a you know a full a full level, 
where it takes these kind of mini mini maps and like glues them together and uh, it's a lot of work to get them to interlock in a way that's convincing that it's just one big fluid world, but um, that's that's the work, right? And um, so yeah, so we drew a lot of inspiration from roguelikes, like you know games like Spelunky. I mean, Hades is really popular right now. That's another um, it has a lot of dynamically generated content. I think both me and Gyro are big fans of Hades. Um, yeah, I know Mark from Wonderville has been talking about how he's been playing it a lot too. Yeah, it's a good game. It's a good game. If you're if you're interested, I I recommend it highly. Uh, I, people are into the story. I'm not super into the story. I think it's just, but I don't I don't know. I think video game stories suck mostly anyway. So, um, uh, which I guess I don't know. People are always asking me about lore, and I'm like, I really don't care. Um. I guess that's just me. But yeah, I th I think that that's kind of where we drew a lot of inspiration from. And and like just giving just making something out of what we had that was different, that felt different, that maybe even had a different audience than Killer Queen. You know, like a something lot that's of parallel in nature and a lot of the players are just not into it at all. You know? Okay. Yeah, I, I can totally understand that. I mean, I'm terrible at Killer Queen. I really enjoy playing, but I'm not a very skilled player because I haven't played a lot. Mm -hmm. And I could understand that I played Abs vs. the Blood Queen, and it's difficult. It's fun. It's very fun, but it is it is difficult, and there's definitely a learning curve with it. So if you have a lot of experience in Killer Queen, you probably would be quite good at it. But you're right. It has such a different dynamic to the game than killer queen does and i guess that kind of leads into the next question i was going to ask and that is what were some of the biggest differences you noticed and like challenges and, and bumps that you hit in the road um that were different from killer queen with abs like were there different aspects of the game that you found more difficult kind of tuning than you did in killer queen um yeah there are different things like you know like a lot of the a lot of the things that like you do in killer queen, like for instance, in killer queen, um, the amount of time that you're invincible is really important, right? Because it has to be fair. Whereas like you could throw all of that out the window. Um, the, the timing for the snail in killer queen has to be pretty slow, otherwise the game would be over too quick, right? But here, you want it to be a little bit quicker, right? So that there's those kind of things, those kind of little system system design differences that are going to just be different, right? Because you're going from a symmetrical system to an asymmetrical system. Um, I think big challenges have been how much, like, one of the nice things about doing like a multiplayer arcade game is that you can get away with very little content. And with a single player asymmetrical game, there's just a lot of content. And uh, there's, there's only so many times you can reuse the same assets without it looking boring. And I think that that's kind of the challenge. That's part of the challenge. It's like just creating a lot of artwork, creating a lot of new new ways to look at this world. Um, you know, and also now we're like, you're competing on Steam, right? And so there's a different set of standards there than like the standards in the arcade, which are like, it, an arcade game, and I've said this before, I think I even said it in the last interview, what makes for an interesting arcade game is diametrically opposed to what makes an interesting home game. And I think right. you also go from multiplayer to single player, there's like a lot of big differences. So, And um, even touching on like you talking about competition, there's only a handful of us in the arcade scene. And we're competing with games from the 70s and 80s. And now you're competing with people that are putting out games every single day. And there are millions of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, like, marketing the game, just just getting it, getting the word out that it even exists is, like, 
you know, like we may be a big deal in arcades, but like we haven't put out a Steam game ever. So, right. like, I mean, outside of Killer Queen Black, but that's really, you know, Liquid Bit. They had a big marketing budget. Like, it's different. Like, we, you know, we're, we don't we don't have like Liquid Bit has investors. We don't have investors. You know, um, so it's a different for us. It's a different kind of challenge. Um, yeah, so, but I would say content is really the biggest biggest difference and the hardest struggle just just volume just volume of content yeah just getting you know like creating all that stuff and then like oh should we create like customizable things like hats and whatever i mean these conversations like start coming into play and then like well okay if we do that we have to create a bunch of assets and blah 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 like you know, oh, you should be able to play as any one of the characters. Well, actually, that's pretty complicated. You know, like, there's, like, there's a bunch of... Th- and just dynamically, like, okay, so, you know, it's great that we're doing these dynamically generated levels, but it's a lot of work to have a computer paint the levels, you know? There was no way... I mean, there's like literally hundreds of these mini maps. There's no way that I was going to hand paint every single one of those maps, right? So right. coming up with systems for the computer to actually paint the maps, you know, that's that's a lot of work. It's it's not even really done yet. It it looks okay. It looks pretty good these days, but it's been an evolution and it's been a lot of work. And Gyro has put in a lot of work to kind of take my specifications and make that into a reality that's just been a lot of work yeah that's something you would never have to do with killer queen because you focus so much on every little yeah. square on that map exactly there's not there's not a there's not a square to spare as they say right you know <laughs> uh, yeah like every little like if we move if we if we make a platform like one tile shorter it has a huge impact you know yeah i mean it does play so much into the game um i guess personally from someone that's more in the marketing and sales side um you said that you took over marketing a little bit more than you had in the future i'm curious as to what you guys did differently with your steam release as opposed to what you have done with killer queen for promotion um well that was before i took over so i took over a little bit before christmas and there's no visible, there's no visible, um, the, the work I'm doing is not going to actually be visible till probably mid April. Um, but I think, um, for the steam release, I think we put a lot of effort into the Kickstarter and like, I've done that before, but I wasn't in charge of that. Uh, this time around and um, again it's like huge amounts of content that you have to create and like get people excited about and like I don't know if for any of for anybody who's done a Kickstarter you know it's is grueling it's just like it's just a, like a, a, a crucible um, like especially as you get to the end you just get exhausted um whereas with killer queen i mean we really didn't have a marketing like our marketing was basically getting the game to places getting the game to conventions and like places where it was going to be seen and played or whatever like getting it to the floor of of you know the game design the game developers conference getting it like like getting people to play it that was the that was the marketing, you know, it wasn't so much about, um, reaching out on social media. I mean, we didn't really have a social media presence at all, uh, pretty early on. And, you know, that's shifted. And especially during COVID where, you know, the game is kind of, there's not a lot of places where you can play it. So I think, that's a that's very different like 
going from real world marketing to online marketing is so, yeah i mean the, the big difference is when when you were marketing killer queen the goal was to take it to a physical space where a lot of people are going to be going and pull traffic into the game as opposed to marketing the steam release was we need to get as many eyes on this as possible on the internet and mm. it's hard to really reach your target demographic so many people can be seeing that that wouldn't even be interested yeah so and you need I to think, just see so many people seeing it i mean honestly i feel like i think part of the reason why i decided to take over the marketing was because i was so frustrated that like we had not we did like even though our game is beloved right people people really like our game right and i, I like yeah. sometimes i'm even surprised like it feels a little weird that like we two schlubs made this game that like we both love so much, you know? And it was frustrating that we could not, even though thousands and thousands of people have actually played this game. I mean, people think about the killer queen competitive community as being the only community of people that have played killer queen, but actually there's a lot of, shadow scenes there's a lot of like casual players or whatever that we have no way of tapping into right like they're they're not on our social media they're not like we we haven't really done a good job and i think partly because early on we were just so busy making the game and trying to get machines out the door or whatever that we weren't really thinking about marketing much but um like it was a little bit frustrating that like we just didn't have really that much marketing muscle, even though people love our game and you know, and thousands and thousands of people have played it, but we have no way of really reaching those thousands of people, you know? So that was that was kind of like the big impetus. Like how do we go from somebody coming in not being in a league, not being on like, you know, Killer Queen spam channel or whatever, but actually knowing who we are and knowing like, hey, we just introduced a new game, blah, 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 you should check it out. You know, like that, making that connection is, um, it's important. At, at this stage for us, it's important because we are going to want to introduce new games and we need to be able to like use some of that goodwill towards introducing people to our new games right and not to mention that if the situation were different from it is right now where the arcade was still open and your cabinet was there the avenue would be to just place some sort of little video on your cabinet during the attract mode sure. but that's not an option right now sure but you know you can overdo it too right? right like you don't you don't want i don't want my arcade machines to feel cheesy and that like they're just like you know like you know when like they're you just play, sales like, items on mobile and it's like constantly advertising another game to you and you're like right. oh, this is gross you know i just like, want to play the game i'm playing i want to play the game i'm playing right but at the same time it would be nice for people to have like a little bit of brand awareness of like like most people don't even know Bumblebear even ex they think of it as just like oh they're killer queen corporation or whatever right and like so making that transition and i think that we have been slowly trying to like raise our brand recognition like bumble bash i think like for a lot of players bumble bash was the first time that they realized that the name of our company was bumble bear <laughs> you know like so trying to raise that awareness and say like hey you know we make other games too maybe you don't like them or or you know, maybe you do, but we, we are an actual game company. We're not just, we're not just making killer queen. Um, so that, that's, it's kind of important that like we do that and we do it with a light touch too, so that it's, I don't want to, I don't want to like shove it down anybody's throat either. Right. So what does the future of Bumble Bear and killer queen and abs look like for you guys? Um, with your roadmap right now for the next year. It's well, pretty unpredictable, but what do you guys, what do you guys see coming for you in the next year? Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, for one thing, 
we're we we tested the name quite extensively and we're we're definitely going to change the name um and i can't really talk about what the name is going to be and i know some people are going to hate the new game new name and some people are not going to like it or some people are going to love it but um we'll see i mean it's uh the the goals are to see if we can make abs a arcade game start introducing that into the arcade market um and and then another big part of what we're doing for bumblebear is um making a big push for black emperor and trying to infiltrate bars we think that there's like a good market there for us and bars um it's it's very small it's smaller than a pinball machine it can fit in a corner you know that kind of a thing and it kind of resonates with a bar crowd like we know like at wonderville like there's a steady audience of people who just love to play black emperor it doesn't get the same kind of fanfare that killer queen does but it's like it's very popular and it's the like, price tag on one of those what's that what's the price tag on one of those uh it's not final because we haven't we haven't finalized um the bomb but i think like i think we're selling it now we were selling it for six grand but i think the final price is probably going to be like just under five okay so you know we want it to be competitive with with other games out there i mean it's definitely competitive against pinball but pinball has like it's it's hard to compete with pinball pinball's forever yeah pinball I mean, forever you can you can make any pinball put any skin on it whatever you want and anybody that plays pinball is gonna be like ooh, i'll try this i mean except i don't know if you follow pinball but what like and i love stern i really do i love those guys i think they're great but wtf man like that led zeppelin cabinet is like an atrocity like i'm just i guess like, i haven't seen it oh it's like no no love went into that cabinet <laughs> at all like it, it like they literally just slapped the cover of led zeppelin one on the side of the cab and, and they called it a day you know like i was just like what is this you know like there's so much good there's so much good iconography around this band and so like, much they could have used so much yeah and like their deluxe model i was just like this is such a horrible color combination like it doesn't feel like led zeppelin at all that's sad that yeah. is really sad that they didn't because i know that they did like the rolling stones and they did kiss and they've done all these other bands well, and i've always thought that those looked cool i mean iron maiden is probably one of my favorite pimp yeah. machines of all time and it's so it's so on theme it's such a good pinball machine. Like the the table is great. Like it is really like you can tell a lot of love went into that into that machine, you know? And like I don't know. I don't know. I <laughs> I mean it, it's kind of it's a little heartbreaking for me, you know, to 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 see that. Like it like Stern is like such a great pinball company and like I love Led Zeppelin and I just feel like oh really really guys i mean, i know it's a pandemic but jesus you know do better well before we wrap everything up um i just want you to give shout outs as well as uh social media links to anybody so that people can check you guys out and find you oh sure sure um so um our social media links are uh just bumblebear games on everything uh linkedin instagram uh twitter uh facebook um we do have also uh at killer queen game on twitter and uh killer queen arcade on facebook uh and then my personal uh instagrams and twitter are just uh and Micros. and uh n is in nancy m is in mary um i k r o s and I guess my uh, 
my shout outs go to the team and also to, um, uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, our, our guy who was doing our social media recently and doing support and, uh, helping us, you know, fill the cracks in so many different ways. Uh, Dexter Chaco, um, which, uh, for people who are in the scene, you know, very well. Um, he recently, uh, left our company last Friday and he will be very much missed. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to Chaco because he's kind of awesome. And, um, yeah, so that's it. Gotcha. Well, shout out Chaco. Definitely agree with that. He's been huge at tournaments and everything. I see him yeah, everywhere I go and he was big in the Minneapolis scene too. Yeah. He's an amazing guy. And, uh, I wish him the best of luck. Well, I want to just thank you again for coming on here and chatting about abs um, and just general game developer situations at this current time and state. Um, if you guys enjoy what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, again, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share, um, whether you're on the YouTube channel or on the podcast. And until next time, peace.